Today I'm going to uh, uh, take you on a little journey, uh, and a journey that will uh, uh, be for many of you a, a foreign language and foreign uh, concepts and things that make no sense. Uh, but guess what? This is the world of tobacco regulation. And, and it is only by living in this world that we are going to stop uh, Altria and the, and the major companies from what the legal people will call regulatory capture. Basically, the tobacco regulatory world, as the most of everything else, including energy, uh, clean air, uh, water, ever, everything, is under regulatory capture, which means that the industries populate the groups that make the decision about what is allowed uh, in terms of the open door, flowing door, back and forth between the agencies and the uh, units within all of the major corporations. All major corporations have senior vice pres presidents for regulatory affairs. Altria has a very highly paid senior vice president of regulatory affairs. And these people know what I'm talking about. Is everything news? It's a work to them. We have ceded that world to them for decades, and now we're paying the price. And that's what this talk is all about, how to recapture the regulatory world. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the 50th anniversary report. It, it's relevant, I mean, partly because this is new and all, but because it, um, in many ways, captures the end of an era of, in terms of what we're doing with tobacco. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about, uh, in that report, we set up a little bit about the role of FDA in the end of the epidemic. In the 2014 report, we called for the end of the epidemic and talked about what it might take to do that. Uh, one of the big steps, though, in bringing FDA into power is that anything they do has to go through a regulatory impact analysis. And I'm going to say, tell you what is that crazy thing. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about why it's so bad and how we might be able to improve it, and particularly about how behavioral economics, which may sound like something that, that you would understand, since it has the word behavioral in it, uh, but you'll realize is a, uh, a foreign language that uses a, 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 a many of the things that you think of as commonplace, but that mixes it all up in Greek and actual Greek letters, and in other strange ways. But we need to learn how to take what we know and improve that world so that we can actually recapture regulatory analysis. One of the key things I'll end with is, of course, what this kind of activity is all about, future research needs. How can we use the money we've got, this opportunity of the, the T cores, to actually do the things that have the highest impact? Okay, 50th anniversary report. Uh, here's the uh, uh, 1964 and the, uh, the big new uh, report. Um, this is really groundbreaking in many ways and took us over uh, four years to produce. And it was, it was a massive volume. Uh, it was only uh, uh, about 980 pages of the first volume, but of course it had about, about 600 pages appendix and then about, a, about another 600 page web appendix. And then we cut a lot more out. Uh, so, uh, you know, the science of tobacco control is massive. We have a massive amount of data and massive amount of information and know about how to end the epidemic. But one of the things, uh, we, ha we have an active Surgeon General. All you hear about, we don't have a Surgeon General. We have a Surgeon General. His, his active Surgeon General, Boris Luciniak, is an incredibly powerful public spokesperson. And as he said, enough is enough. You know, when are we going to stop allowing the unnecessary disease and death from this type of behavior that we've known about since the 50s. We really, we really know about it from the 30s. And the, the epidemiology wasn't converted into action because of World War II. You know, the, the, the first epidemiologists had kind of figured it out in the late 30s. And actually, the Nazis picked up on that and were talking about uh, you know, anti-smoking and all this kind of stuff in the 30s. And this was all kind of common knowledge. And World War II kind of interrupted things and what the industry was took to their advantage. And so we why are we letting generation after generation fall prey? Well, uh, one of the things is that we counted up the dead bodies. 
And, you know, when we say, why am I doing this? People ask you, why are, isn't the battle over? Well, guess what? Uh, 20 million people have already died from tobacco uh, in the last 50 years. Because we poorly did prevention, only we only saved 8 million. So we saved one of three. And the projections are that 5.6 million kids alive today are going to die of tobacco-related disease if we keep staggering along at this sloggy pace that we're at. That's why you're in this. 5.6 million kids are in the pipeline to being the victims of the tobacco industry unless we do things better. Now, we counted up a whole bunch more diseases, and the thing is that uh, almost every organ in the body is affected. You know, the, you know the, we know so much about the damage, and we know so much about what is the bad aspects of the product, all these kind of things. Why aren't we acting? What's, what's stopping us? Oh. Judge Kessler did a, a lot in the DOJ case, uh, the Department of Justice case against the tobacco industry, uh, convicting them uh, as, as uh, adjudicated, proven racketeers. Uh, and, you know, and that's I can say this as a federal employee because this the DOJ attorneys say that I'm not saying it often enough that the tobacco industry is adjudicated lying criminals who, who are preying upon our children. That's what the DOJ case finding said. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not breaking rules as a federal employee to say that that's what the trial said. Now, we used to be worried about the mosquito and, uh, and now we've moved on to tobacco, but who is our vector? It is this predatory industry that has, this is a conclusion of the Surgeon General report that the, this epidemic and these 20 million deaths and these 5.6 deaths that are projected are, are initiated and sustained by the aggressive strategies of the tobacco industry, which has deliberately misled the public by of the risk of smoking and false, misleading, uh, and fraudulent behavior. That is fact. Now, you would say that that's kind of, isn't that enough justification to do regulation? I mean, kind of, you know, the everyday person would hear that and say, well, then well, why don't you just implement the FDA regulations? I mean, you know, the, you know, what? why not? Well, one of the things that's happening is we have this whole new emerging uh, arena of products, and all of these new products are kind of blurring the situation. And the industry is happy to keep it blurred and happy to keep it kind of ambiguous. And they are part of the solution. And I'll talk about that tomorrow. My, my webinar will talk tomorrow about how the industry is capturing the potential, if this has a potential. And if it has a potential, we laid out in the Surgeon General Report very clearly. We said, if these things are going to have a potential of doing something positive, we need to change the environment where the appeal, accessibility, promotion, and use of cigarettes and other combusted tobacco products are being rapidly reduced, especially among youth and young adults. We went so far as to talk about the elimination, the banning, the end of the ability to sell and promote these inherently deadly products, because what we call them in the report is a defective and unreasonably dangerous product. And we say that it, 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 the rapid elimination of their use will dramatically reduce the burden. The Surgeon General report, this, the most credible scientific says we need to eliminate, not reduce, not bargain with, not play footsie with, we need to eliminate that whole segment of of the industrial society. How can we do it? Well, we talk about a lot of things in, in the report. And uh, FDA is mentioned. And uh, we lay out some of the possibilities. Uh, the FDA is a toothless lion unless we enable it to use all of this science. And I'm going to talk about why the, in, the regulatory capture will keep them from doing any of these things, of nicotine content, making it less appealing, uh, toxicity levels. Let me tell you, I helped write the 209 law. I helped write it started in 1997, first wave of the McCain bill. I, I've been involved with the, the actual language and working with Mitch Zeller and these people for, for a decade. The intent of that third bullet is completely legal. Could be done today if we had a fully empowered FDA 
could say, you no longer can have a filter. You can no longer have ventilation. You can no longer have any additive. You are not banning tobacco. You may chop up tobacco leaf and roll it up and sell it. It will be harsh. It will be horrible. It will be almost unsmokable. And by the way, the smoke it produces must have a pH of greater than 8.5, which means it cannot go in the lungs. That's all, and they could release that standard right now, right now. And combusted tobacco would be worthless as a sellable product. That's not quite happening. But that's the law. How can we get from here to there? Well, one of the ways is actually that we talk about in the report is that this group, the other 13 T cores, all of this process is focused, quote, at FDA regulation. Tobacco regulatory science implies it's at the federal level. Guess what? I predict that the true power of regulation is going to be that bottom bullet. Local and state product category bans. As with smoke-free policy, if we were waiting for OSHA to have smoke-free policies in 1970s, we still have, would have smoking in elevators, smoking in airplanes, smoking everywhere, because OSHA is in, under total regulatory capture. The director of OSHA told me, don't you dare. This was uh, 1209 when he was 20. Don't you dare from the office make any effort to ask for a national smoke-free policy. We'll be destroyed in the regulatory process. That's the head of OSHA told me this. So we will never be able to get a real uh, smoke-free policy through the federal regulatory system. So all of smoke-free is from the bottom up. Will tobacco regulation go the same route? I say yes. I say that the real power of regulation is going to come from the bottom up. Why do I say that? Well, one of the reasons why is that anything we do from the federal government, particularly FDA, has to go through a regulatory impact analysis. And what is this? What is this crazy thing? Well, most of what you know about this is from this type of cartoon. That what FDA has done under the regulatory impact analysis has produced uh, a regulatory impact analysis that justifies this cartoon. This cartoon is not wrong. The cost-benefit analysis produced under the two uh, uh, rules and the proposed deeming rules so far have, by FDA has said that the pleasure of smoking offsets the cost and benefits by 70%. This cartoon is not a joke. This is what is happening in Washington. Now, why? How could this happen? Well, guess what? The industries that don't want to be regulated have been working a long time, since well before, the, particularly since the Reagan administration, to build the rules that make sure that they can't be regulated. And the, these are three big documents that we all need to, to learn and love. Uh, Executive, by the way, this is not in law. This is all executive action. And the first uh, codification of this was in 1993, executive order. It didn't take to say too much. It basically gave OMB authority to control the process. And then uh, in uh, 2003, the whole process was laid out in more detail. Here it is, circular, uh, circular A4. I didn't know this thing existed, and I, was in, I, I thought I was pretty well informed. I, until I got slammed with, with the FDA regulatory impact analysis, I didn't know this thing existed. I know it very well now. <laughs> and then we say, well, you know, with the new administration, uh, maybe this will get better. There's, there's more positive economists that are running the Office of Budget and Management. So we got the executive order in 2011 that said they put some frost, nice frosting on this 
horrible cake. And uh, they basically said, you still got to do all of this, but, but, but read that. There's one sentence in there that says that you need to get consideration to alternatives. And, and you need to, uh, so they, they basically pointed to a few places that said, you know, try to make, try to make it a, a not so terrible. That's basically what the executive order says. Yeah. You have to do it, but maybe you can make it not so terrible. Uh, so this is all in the background. This stuff has all existed. This is all the history. It's there. And guess what? The person who helped write that executive order is now the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So if you think that the, uh, that the leadership of FDA and the leader of HHS is going to save us, dream on. So who, what does it have to be done for? Well, there's a lot of mumbo jumbo, but basically anything the federal government does that has an annual impact on the economy of $100 million or more has to go through this process. Now, the other thing, buried within this nice little document, it says that these are the kind of things that have to be taken into consideration from a societal perspective, and that they have to convert everything that they talk about into a single econometric, monetized uh, metric. That means that things like making people happy is irrelevant, or that people feel bad about their, their choice is irrelevant if you can't turn it into a quantized, monetized unit. And to help kind of you know, you know, embed it in this document, it says that when we, you normally think of cost benefit analysis of saying that uh, the cost of doing an, uh, a regulation, I mean like changing the warning labels, the printing cost, or the, the, uh, the process of taking the old packs off and putting new packs on, all that kind of producer kind of process, that's the cost of implementation? Well, yeah. But you have to also look at the careful language. There is an opportunity cost. That's what they call it in econometrics. An opportunity cost has to be added to the cost of implementation. Well, what is this opportunity cost? Oh, opportunity cost is that if your regulation makes something that people want to use cost more, then they, are, they have lost a, 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 a benefit. You know, so let's say that we decided that the shirts that we made are being made in sweatshops in the third world and that we're going to put a regulation that they all have to, all the shops that, that, uh, that make shirts that we sell in the U.S. have to follow our OSHA worker standards and that means that the price of shirts go up 50%. Well, you know, that means I'm paying 50% more for the shirt, the same product. So I am having a loss to save those foreign workers. That is, like, that is what consumer surplus loss is. That for something that we say of doing a good, I have to pay 50% more for my shirt. Now, for a lot of regulation, that, you know, it, 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 we may not like it, but that it kind of makes sense. Now, Sheldon likes this. <laughs> here's, a, here's what economists see in, in 101. Here's the kind of thing that they look at. You see over there on the left, there's that shaded area. That's because at a certain price, P0, uh, they, they buy Q0. But people would keep buying the shirt or the good or the thing until the price got all the way up there to A. Somebody would still buy it way up there. That means that the area underneath from A all the way down, that whole triangle, is the is the savings or the, the cheap price good surplus that people get. It, it, uh, it, it, and if we, by regulation, bring that price up to P1, they're going to buy less of it, which means that over here on the right, that shaded bar, that's this lost benefit that <coughs> the average person who doesn't give a damn about the workers in the third world is having to pay more for the shirt, and they don't like it, and that's their surplus. That's a loss to them that the OMB says we have to take into consideration. Okay, this is, this is pretty crazy uh, types of uh, stuff. And, um, but economists basically like this because it does make sense for most products. Uh, but it's based upon a few fundamental assumptions. And this is what is taught in Econ 101, is that 
Consumers are perfectly rational. In other words, they understand the products and they understand the cost and they understand the market and, they're, and, they, and, they, and they can make decisions about, I like uh, grass-fed beef more than, than uh, uh, feedlock beef and I'll pay more for that because I'm making a decision that, that I'll pay more because there's ethical reasons why I'm willing to buy uh, grass-fed beef. That's a, they know the information, they're fully informed, they're, and they're making a decision to pay more for something based upon their own values. Uh, and it means that particularly there's an assumption that people, and this is really very hard usually to uh, fulfill, are forward-looking. And we know that most of us really aren't, that we uh, uh, eat that piece of chocolate now and not worry about the fact that it might not be good for us in terms of eating a piece of chocolate every day causing uh, arterial damage, or raise cholesterol, all these kinds of things. We like the chocolate and we respond to the immediate reward and we don't think about the future damage. To apply the simple rules, you assume that people actually do think about the 30-year damage. At least they bring some of that forward in the decision making. But guess what? We know from decades that smokers don't do that very often. In fact, uh, it's assuming that far looking smokers choose the, the, the cigarette smoking amount they're smoking now and, and, eat, and plan to keep smoking for years into the future because they think that, that they choose that because that's going to maximize their happiness and, and pleasure. That's not really the reality for most smokers. But that's what's under, underlying the, uh, the, these types of models. Now, in a, in a recent paper in, published in, uh, in 2004 in Health Economics, a, a, uh, Elizabeth Ashling, Clark Nittarelli, and uh, Rosemary Lafferty published a, an analysis based upon these types of assumptions and these types of rules and uh, an estimation of consumer surplus that said that at least two-thirds of the gross health benefits, all, all, in other words, all the benefits of, of helping people quit smoking in response to gra graphic warning labels or any other regulation, that the benefit that would be accrued to them in society by quitting before the damage of smoking, two-thirds of that need to be offset for the lost pleasure or consumer surplus. Now, who are these people? Well, they were all economists at, at FDA that helped write the original rules. And now Elizabeth Ashley has moved over to OMB and Bill will be reviewing any application from FDA. And Clark Narelli is still there and very proud of the fact that uh, he has got this published that justifies everything that he's done in these past analysis that say that you need to have 70% offset. He's still there, as is Rose Marie. These people are still involved in the process. Now, uh, a number of health, uh, leading health economists, uh, Frank, leading by Frank Chalupa, Ken Warner, uh, Jonathan Gruber at, at Harvard, uh, uh, John New, Newhouse, uh, Thomas Schelding, uh, both the last two uh, Nobel laureates, uh, they're a pretty, pretty powerful group of people. They had a number of criticism of this whole process. And they, you know, they thought that uh, health economics had been hijacked by, by what had been done in these regulatory impacts. They particularly were uh, mad about the fact that uh, uh, the the crude estimation within the uh, regulatory in impact analysis underestimated the benefit of, uh, of, of, of the, the warning labels and how much benefit it would have in prevention and cessation by a factor of 30. Uh, the, the, the internal economists said they didn't care about that, and we had been telling them this behind the firewall, you know, us in government had been telling them this kind of stuff. Said they don't care because the, 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 the amount of benefit in the little benefit that we estimated in the premature lives is so big, it doesn't matter if we're missing it by a factor of 10. Ah, that doesn't matter. It's so big already. Yeah, yeah. The other thing, though, they emitted a lot of potential important benefits because of the simplistic rule of saying that premature death 30 years later is going to be uh, used as the primary measure in the years of life lost and the value of, of, of those years of life and this, you know, a whole bunch of econometric stuff on that, uh, was a, the, the simple basic way of doing it. Uh, it disregarded all the short-term benefits like uh, uh, prevented uh, 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 premature births or uh, impact on smoke, uh, smoke, uh, secondhand smoke exposure or a whole bunch of things, as well as preventing heart attacks, which could be prevented within a year or two of the tobacco product change. Uh, all of that was, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, so these are not trivial things. 
But the big thing that irritated the heck out of the, the health economists was that they said, if you're going to apply these rules, we need to think about it beyond just this very simple e Econ 101 structure. And we particularly need to think about things of information deficit. This, uh, well, by the way, I'm shifting, I'm changing language. Uh, you know, I, I stopped stopping te teaching, uh, speaking in English. I'm just going to start speaking in econo speak. <laughs> and so we need to worry about information deficit, power of addiction, age of initiation, present bias, and projection bias. So the, you know, three of those terms you may have never heard before. But that's all right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to explain those. Um, now, all of those things are important, and the economists knew that they were important, and that we needed to pay more attention to those if we are going to win the battle of the regulatory impact analysis. All this matters. Now, what are these things? Well, let's start with the fact that if we are going to assume that we're going to apply this simple kind of regulatory impact analysis model, we have to make a kind of a broad assumption that there are reasonably well-informed, rational addicts who are content with their choice to continue smoking. And guess what? A lot of health economists believe that those people exist. Now, they, won't, they don't like to get into the argument of you know, how many of them there are, but they're saying those people exist. And if you don't recognize in your discussion with, with econometrically oriented policymakers that these people exist, you are going to be considered uninformed and naive. These people are assumed to exist. Now, and they will throw up to you the example, the one that I know personally, Stoney Stallone, a former dean of the School of Public Health who smoked to his death. Uh, now, he, uh, Stoney knew facts, but you, know, you, know, you can argue was it addiction or was it choice, but the fact is that uh, you can find examples of well-informed people who continue to smoke because they like to smoke. But let's look at facts. 87% uh, of future daily smokers begin before 18. And all economists and all policymakers say that at least 18, if not higher, uh, is the age at which people are, cannot be assumed to make an informed choice. We all know that adolescents make stupid, ill-informed, risky, behavioral choices all the time. That's a fact. And the fact that 87% of current addicted smokers attain their addiction, which controls their behavior when they were under this age of reason, is a big factor. It's not trivial. Secondly, 90% of, of current smokers express regret about ever having started to smoke. Now, economists say attitudes and and all are not as valued, but, but still, the, the durability of that, uh, uh, that uh, expression as well as the backing up of, a number of other data about uh, people who have quit who re express regret for, for having quit and all these type of things are all, say that's a very real number. That about 90% of the addicted smokers are, don't want to be doing it. 70% of them express a desire to quit, and 43% of them are annually making an attempt to break the addiction and are failing. They're expressing in their revealed preference that they really don't want to be doing this thing. Now, that's pretty strong evidence. Here's the regret data from the, the Gallup, and, how, and it has been incredibly durable, incredibly high, and incredibly uh, consistent across uh, a gender and a, a number of, of demographics. You know, 90% of the people who are addicted smokers are regretting the fact that they started when they did when they were adolescents. Now, you would think that would make a difference. Well, it helps. It puts the arguments. You, you kind of say that 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 should, that that should be taken into consideration in this whole in this whole process. Another thing, though is that when you think about this whole decision-making process among youth, we know from a lot of data from the 2012 Surgeon General Report, from another lot of other things, that there's very impaired decision-making among adolescents and young adults all the way up to 26. We know 
by a lot of behavioral and neurological and, and uh, the, the evidence that many of you have worked on all your career, that this, this is something that's not really debatable. And that we know, and uh, this is you know, I'm coming in the econo talk, present bias. That, that means I value the current more than the future. In other words, if I was offered, if you gave me $100 now, but you would give me $130 in six months, how likely am I to take the $100 would be the present bias. In other words, I would take less money if I could have it now. We know that kids do this all the time, that they heavily discount everything in the future. In fact, the, the future doesn't exist beyond about three years. It, it, you know, and that is a big factor. And I'm going to talk about how we bring that into the model. Secondly, under appreciation of nicotine addiction, you talk to kids, they don't think they're going to be addicted. They don't believe that, that they are going to lose control of their choices. They all say, I'll, it, I'm, I'm doing it now because it, you know, my friends are doing it and it makes me look kind of like I, I'm breaking the rules. And there's all these other kind of rationalizations they, that they have about the value of this risky behavior in the present. And they don't worry about the future. Well, we know this. I mean, you know, psychologically, this is all news to us. But that is called projection bias in econometrics. That they don't appreciate how their current behavior is going to control their future behavior. Uh, secondly, they are incredibly optimistic about that they that they're going to the probability they're going to quit soon enough. That is also part of this projection bias. They are underestimating the power of the current behavior predicting their future behavior. And then there is the broad whole area of acute and persistent effects of nicotine on the developing brain, which is in econometric talk is impaired consumer sovereignty. You assume that if someone is making an informed choice, that they are a sovereign consumer, making their own independent choices to maximize their benefit, that they have ability to do that. If you have impaired sovereignty, other, other words it means that I have to smoke this next cigarette or otherwise I'm going to feel lousy from nicotine withdrawal, you have impaired sovereignty. But even worse is if you smoke since adolescent and your brain receptor sites are permanently, permanently altered and, 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 and in fact the frontal lobe decision making is most impacted by the nicotine damage, <coughs> you lose ability to make decisions. Now I kind of think that should relate to all of this process. Now all of us think that God, these things why, you know, these things should, should matter. Well, there's kind of an assumption in, among the policymakers, yeah, 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 yeah. But what about that mature, rationally well-informed addict, that mature guy who knows all about this and says, I am a libertarian who wants to do it. I know what I'm doing, and I'm going to enjoy my nicotine and my cigarettes. And by you're doing these regulations, you're taking something away from me, and you're making me pay more for it, and, that, and I'm really mad at you. Okay? They exist. They're out there. Yeah, I, can go, I, don't, I don't think I have to talk to more than 10 people on the street to find one of them. Uh, they're out there. And... We have to discount those people's opinion and what they're, you know, how they're being taken into this whole process. One of the things is they say, I know, I know. And in fact, the industry uses risk analysis. Uh, for over 30 years, they've, they've been funding uh, health economics and a whole bunch of groups to do research showing that smokers are fully and well informed. Actually, if you know risk perception, and you really understand the science of risk perception, you can produce, uh, uh, I could produce right now, I can produce a survey that, that says that smokers <coughs> overestimate the risk of lung cancer threefold. That they're pessimistic and they, they overestimate their risk. How do you do it? You say, what, is, what, 
what proportion of heavy smokers are going to have lung cancer? That's, you ask that question. The, real, the reality is about 12 to 15 percent. And they'll say close to 50 percent. A lot of most smokers will say like 50 percent. See, aha! They overestimate their risk. See, 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 they're not only informed, but they're, over, they're, they're, they're pessimistic. They're over informed and they're over pessimistic about their risk. Reality is, if you ask that question correctly, they underestimate the risk by 50 to 75 percent. If you actually put the risk information into the format that a Paul Slovak or people say, here's the right way of asking it. One, one paper had that. We kind of need to replicate that. Uh, when, you, when you only have one paper uh, to fight the industry's 40 papers, I mean, you know, that's not good. Uh, additionally, uh, some other uh, work shows that about uh, 40, only 40% 40 of current smokers would judge themselves at high risk for smoking related premature death. You know, only 40%. And it goes down to 10% when you get down to uh, 15 to 25 year olds. And, of course, the reality is they're all going to, uh, virtually all, if they persist, persist in smoking, they all are going to die prematurely. It's only a matter of how many years of, uh, they lose. But they're all prob optimistically saying, I'm going to quit in time. Or, I, don't smoke, I don't smoke that much. Or I smoke low-tar cigarettes. Or, or they have all these reasons why they aren't really at, at high risk. Only a couple of papers. <clears throat> we need to replicate that. We need a lot more data. And then one of them that I've pulled out in, a, in a, the recent paper they're working on, in econometrics, one of the things that um, irritates the uh, classic economists most is when there is something called information asymmetry. That means that the producing industry has information that it hides and it misrepresents to the consumer that distorts their ability to make an informed choice. That's considered kind of bad, really bad market failure. That's bad producer behavior. That's bad uh, uh, distortion of the market. And guess what? That's what that conclusion in the Surgeon General Report talked about. They're adjudicated as lying criminals. So it's not a question if that's what they do. That's what they do. Now, one of the kind of uh, classic examples of that is that the sales of low-tar cigarettes increased from 2% in 1967 to 95% in, two, in 2011, and at the same time, lung carcinoma, adenocarcinoma risk increased. That's objective data that they were distorted in their purchasing under the assumption they were buy, buying something that was less risky that was actually increasing their risk. We're trying to make that kind of uh, more known because that is a, what is considered a really bad market failure. Now, all of this, uh, it kind of, uh, there's also, uh, all of this uh, is relating to, again, this question, are there reasonably well-informed rational addicts? In addition to all that information, another line of evidence that we are presenting is that, well, and, and, and Ken Warner particularly likes this, Frank Chupka and others, uh, that, uh, well, aren't there a segment of the market that we can say is kind of a generally proxy of if there's a well-informed group of people uh, and they're still smoking, maybe that would define how, how what proportion of the smoking consumption is in that category. Guess what? If we take U.S. physicians, it's less than 3%. So, well, you know, one argument is that, well, if you're going to apply this consumer surplus, you only can apply it to 3% of the market. The other 97% is off limits because they aren't well informed and they are being lied to and their, uh, their whole marketing choices are distorted. Now, that all sounds... Uh, uh, that all sounds good, but one of the things I've learned in two and a half years of fighting this process from, the, from behind the firewall is that I've been losing, and we've been losing badly. So we created a, uh, it's in a comment that's going through clearance, and I'm hoping to have submitted soon, a, uncertainties of quantifying the optimal internality tax on cigarettes. Now that's foreign language. Uh, uh, and guess what? We tried to bring all of these factors into, econo in, into an econometric formulas so that we could take care of this short-term discounting, which is this uh, present bias, taking into account this information deficit, which is a psi factor, 
and we can take into consideration subcontrol errors due to addiction rho or projection bias alpha. We built upon a formula. This is real econometric talk, but this you can go and look at this stuff. And now I'm diving into my Benedict Hall math days. Uh, there is a term, optimal attacks, tau, uh, that is a, a uh, the welfare gain for policy is this tau minus the externality divided by the discounted future health benefit. And this is where the 70% comes from. If you don't take account enough account of the things that are related to this top side of the equation, you get 70%. That tau minus E is 30% of the long-term benefits. That's where it comes from. So what we did is we looked, well, uh, well, what a number of health economists and what we've been doing said, well, 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 if we improve that beta, because they were using it about, at about a 0.8 or 0.7, so if we improve that beta, maybe we can, we, can, we can win because they accept that's a factor that needs to be adjusted. Well, guess what? Using a beta of 0.6, which is, uh, more than they were, had been using, gives us an internality tax of $14, which gives us a net to gross of 0.4, which means that 60% of the benefits are offset. We were still, we were losing. We were losing. We, we so what we've done now in this paper, we've started the, the, the basis for arguing that beta actually could be 0.2, particularly for young smokers, which would mean that only 20% would be offset. Still not what we what I'm willing to accept. So we expanded the model. A lot more Greek letters, a lot more terms, a lot more characteristics. The driving factor that you need to take away from this and understand is over here on the right side. One minus psi. Psi is how much uh, misinformation, how much the smoker doesn't understand. So that term, one minus psi times delta H, is at the, at the bottom, the proportion of the future health consequences overlooked by smokers. They don't take it into the decision-making process because they don't even know it. It's beyond them. So that uh, what we're doing is saying, hey, there's a big chunk of this stuff that comes into this equation which y'all are not paying any attention to. Secondly, we're saying that 1 minus beta is not the only adjustment. There's this whole range of other things of, uh, of uh, in the tau, uh, I mean, no, excuse me, uh, uh, it, it, that is re, uh, related to the alpha and rho uh, factor, all this addiction, all this other stuff, the projection bias things. Now, when we put all of this stuff into consideration, even without doing the projection factor, and if we uh, bring beta down and bring the psi up, uh, uh, we think that this at the bottom here, this. 0.95, in other words, that only 5% of the benefit would be offset, is a defensible number. But we have, to, we have to have the science to support that beta and support that psi. We are not going to win this by saying we, we like these numbers. We are going to win by having the evidence that proves that our behavioral science and our understanding of of tobacco choice behavior and the behavior of adolescents and, and youth actually re is reflected better in parameters that are down toward the bottom of this table. Now, if we don't, there's going to be more of these cartoons. 70% is going to stay the going to stay the number. Now, what can we do? Critical research needs. And I've mentioned a couple of times of things that we need. But particularly, we need a broader range by race, sex, race, ethnicity, education, income, and addiction levels. We need you know, more fine-grained understanding of this whole discounting. We talk about, we, we, it's obvious to us who, in the behavioral sciences who have worked on all this stuff that, that kids totally discount the future. And we also know from a lot of behavioral science that the smokers who, who discount the future are less likely to quit. We know that, and so that even though mature smokers may become more informed, the ones who become more informed quit, and the ones who are still smoking at 45 are the ones who suffer the most of this kind of problem. We need to document that. Secondly, 
we need to document the risk perceptions. The industry has spent decades building up a database in the econometric literature using risk analysis questions that are biased toward the answer that they want. We have to answer the question using good risk perception analysis based upon what we know about risk, documenting the magnitude of underestimation of risk. It's got to be in many ways, not only lung cancer, but all risk and all the kind of way that people process risk. It's not only how they process risk, but also how they discount that processing by saying, I'm going to quit in time. I, smoke, I, I don't smoke enough. I, I, my, the product that I smoke isn't so bad. I don't inhale. And there's all of this stuff that people use to say, I know that there's a risk, but it doesn't apply to me. We need to document that, quantify that, and put it into these econometric terms. Then we also need to document these addiction and optimistic of, uh, ability to quit errors, alpha and rho. How many smokers believe that they can actually quit? Almost none. But they say that they're going to quit. I'm going to quit soon enough. Until they get to a point where they get into a learned helplessness. There's all this kind of, you know, there's understanding of, the, you know, that they, they finally become fatalistic and give up. And so they lose their ability to make an informed decision because they basically fatalistically said, it's going to kill me, I can't do anything about it, so that's just the way it is. Now that is not, not choosing a pleasurable choice that's saying they're going to, the firing squad is already set up, I, they're, they're, they've got, they're loading their guns and they're going to march me over there and I can't do anything about it. Now that's not exactly a choice of pleasure, but that's the way it's interpreted if we don't reinterpret it. Uh, another big thing, and a lot of what y'all are already doing, is population estimates of impact of potential regulatory uh, actions. We have to read the future of the types of things that might happen and quantify how different populations may react to that. And the quantification of the, uh, of the alternatives and a, a ban on flavorings, a ban on, uh, on uh, package coloring, or, ban, uh, or uh, large warning labels, or on uh, ban on point of purchase uh, advertising, all, you know, any of these kind of possible actions need to be quantified in terms of how much they'll impact different people by race, ethnicity, age, different education levels, different race, ethnicity, strata, different urban, rural. And we need to quantify the benefits of how much, you know, these actions of whatever, whoever is doing these things are going to benefit us individually and the society in terms of long and short term benefits. Finally, we need to convert all of this stuff into behavioral economics. Now, what do I mean by that? That means that all of this econometric talk and these crazy formulas that I've been throwing up here matter. You have to learn to talk econometrics. You have to publish your findings in econometric good journals. For example, Anna Song and, and Stan and all published a very nice summary of the problems of consumer surplus in the American Journal of uh, Public Health. Guess what? In a major meeting that was held in Washington a couple of months ago by senior economists convened by HHS, they, they said, oh, that paper doesn't matter. They threw it off. It wouldn't even cite it. It's irrelevant. It's published in that public health. It talks about stuff that we don't think is, is correct. It's, it, it, you know, it's, just, it, it's just criticizing us without understanding anything about our science. So if you're going to attack this world, you have to play in their field. You have to publish your findings that take into consideration these types of terms, present bias, projection bias, information deficit, consumer sovereignty. All of those kinds of things have to make sense to you and that as you're looking at your data, you need to be thinking, how do I take my results as well as my decades of knowledge about human behavior and convert them into those types of issues because that's how we'll win the battle. And we're going to keep losing and we're going to keep having a large proportion of our health benefits in the cost benefit analysis, which means 
an offset, which means that we have to produce a much bigger effect to have a positive cost-benefit analysis. Something that might save 100,000 kids, eh, not a big enough effect. I mean, so we could do good, but not enough good because it would lose in this type of regulatory analysis. Because the industry will show that it's costing them a terrible amount to have to change their package. Or it, it's a loss of, of choice to smokers to lose their menthol. And all of these kind of things are going to be winning the argument until we win the information battle. And that's really what I have the message to tell you, is that we've lost. We've lost over the last several years. And we're going to continue to lose until we convert our knowledge into the right language. Thank you.